Sound in the suit I got sign in the street box I can with my mood I'm in sign that I'm moving Wake up I'm going with y'all. Seventy Eight Sports TV here. Salute to the mighty LDBC Lions Den Boxing Community. For those who don't know, now you know. And today I have a very, very special guest in the building, a, a boxing legend. Okay, uh, this is, this is man was one of my favorite fighters when I was a young brother coming up. You know what I mean? And uh, he has beaten. The likes of uh, Frank Tate, Marlon Starlin, Iran Barkley, Columbia, you know what I'm saying, uh, Donald Curry, let's go on and on. And uh, that man is Michael. Michael, second to none. How you doing today, brother? Oh, everything is well, brother. All praises do, man. How about yourself? I'm doing wonderful, wonderful, man. It's, it's good to see you in good spirits, man. And, uh, you know, um, see, see you out here shaking the moving, man. Then you're free. As you should be, you know. Um, how you feeling right now, man? How you feeling? Man, listen here, man. I can't complain. Ain't nobody going to listen, but everything's great. Just trying to shake things and keep it focused and uh, you know, duck that coronavirus because it ain't nothing nice. They need to hurry and find uh, a cure to the situation so we can start the world back up and keep things moving. But uh, everything's great on my side. Absolutely, absolutely. So all right, for the, for the young cats that might not know who Michael Nunn is, you know, why don't you uh, give us a, a brief, you know, history lesson, or it ain't got to be brief. Just go down, tell us who you are and um, uh, some of your accomplishments in the sport of boxing. Well, uh, my name is Michael Second to None. Uh, I'm a two-time world boxing champion. That's all you got to do is Google my name or go to YouTube, and they got an archive of uh, entertainment uh, of my fights uh, showing who I am and what I am and what I've done in the great sport of boxing. So, uh that's all you got to do, fellas, is go to YouTube or Google that name, Michael Second to None. Remember, Michael Second to None, not just Michael Nunn, because you go on the thing, there's a million Michael Nunns, but there's only one original, extraordinary guy by the name of Michael Second to None. It's a bunch of Michael Nunns, but there's only one Second to None. So you guys want right. to see me, just go on YouTube or Google the name, Michael Second to None, two-time world boxing champion, and they'll show you archives of history, live and in color. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. You know, and I want to ask you this too. I always want to ask you this. When nowadays, when they talk about the greatest middleweights of all time, do you feel like your name is supposed to be mentioned in the greatest middleweights of all time? Well, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, uh, I think so, but um, I let people be the judges. You know what I mean? You know, you got these different people. You got a lot of people just judging, uh, making these decisions. They never boxed before, don't know nothing about boxing, but they want to be boxing uh, enthusiasts. So, I mean, I know, as long as I know that I was a great fighter, that's what really matters because a lot of them said I couldn't do this or couldn't do that, but I've done everything they said I couldn't do. And, you know, I never get caught up with what man says because man says anything. You know, what he says don't uh, necessarily have to be right. But, hey, when they do mention my name, I think it's a great honor. But when they don't, it's still a great honor because I knew what I accomplished in the great sport of boxing. And I think I could compete in any uh, era of boxing in the middleweight division. And we've had a lot of legendary great champions, guys that I love and admire. And I learned a lot from a lot of the great guys like your Sugar Ray Robinsons, your Thomas Hearns, your Marvin Hagler, your uh, uh, Carlos Munzones, and, and your legendary Sugar Ray Leonard. So, I mean, hey, uh, you know, it just makes me feel honored to be able to say I was a middleweight champion of the world and to be in a um, uh, division that was probably one of the best divisions in boxing. All the divisions are great, but it's something about the middleweight division, the lightweight division, and the heavyweight and the welterweight division. But, you know, anytime you become a world champion, I mean, it's a heck of an accomplishment because it ain't like you just go to the, the ring and they uh, present you a belt. You got to earn that belt through blood, sweat, and tears. And I think I've done everything in my power to overcome and be, to become a world champion, not one time, but two times. And, you know, it was always just a great honor for me to be able to say I was a middleweight champion of the world. After knowing guys like the legendary Ray Leonard and the Ray Robinson, they once held these uh, illustrious championship belts now that I once upon had myself. So it was outstanding, you know, for God, I would become a two-time world champion when people said it couldn't be done, but they told a story and I didn't want right. to leave it. Right, right. Okay, uh, you know, another question uh, I always want to ask you uh, when I told myself, whenever I get a chance, the opportunity to talk to Michael Nunn, I'm going to get the answers to these questions. And that was, 
uh, the Goosemans. What ever happened uh, with your relationship with the Goosemans? Well, we kind of had a falling out. We couldn't we couldn't repair it. Uh, it was uh, something I tried to leave in the back burner. You know, Dan, he's 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 deceased now. He's a great manager. I mean, we started off together back in '84, and we went to the top of the boxing ring. Well, uh, wrong uh, when they said it couldn't be done. Like Dan Goosen always told all the big promoters back in the day, they had the gold medalist, but Goosen had the gold nugget, which was Michael second to none. And like I said, we started from the bottom. But I mean, we went all the way to the top. We shook the world July 28th when, when we knocked out Frank Tate to become the world middleweight champion. So, you know, I mean, we had a great relationship while it lasted. And then Joe, my trainer, a, a great trainer today and a good man. He's uh, doing commentating and still training on the side. But we had a great relationship. But I guess, you know, sometimes when relationships end, you try to mend them. But they, they don't always uh, be the same. And, you know, we kind of went our separate ways. And, you know, I always wish the best for them. It was always, you know, wishing the best for me. And it was just something that happened. And, and you know, it was, it was the end of that um, that era, you know what I'm saying? Not right. to, you know, make nobody feel bigger or smaller than the next man. It was just, it was time to separate. And it, it was uh, something that had to be done. But, uh, you know, I, when I was there, I enjoyed the relationship. Matter of fact, I was the Goosen's first world champion. So, you know, I helped, you know, take them to the boxing room and to help get their name established. And, you know, they had other guys saying, well, you know, you guys took Michael Nunn. To that uh, plateau, so maybe you could take me there. So you know, it was a great relationship. We always worked together. No doubt, no doubt about it. Okay. Uh, also, uh, tell us about what happened um, uh, after your boxing career. Okay, uh, you got you had some legal trouble and had to serve some uh, some some time in prison. What happened with that situation? Well, you know, I I, I got involved in some things. Maybe I shouldn't have been involved in, but like I said, I went to jail, done my time. I didn't cry to the federal government when they said. You got to do 24 years in jail. I said, well, okay, I accept the responsibility. I didn't become no rat. I didn't become no informer. I didn't do nothing of that nature. I stood tall. I went to jail, done my time, and I come home, and I'm home. All praise to the Lord for blessing me to be able to endure my prison sentence. I'm back bigger, better, stronger, and ready to you know, show people the prison don't uh, define you. It's how you can uh, conduct yourself and how, how you make commitments and make better decisions in your life to better yourself. So uh, it was something I had to do. It was something I, I put in the back burner because I have so many more things to do. And, you know, God is still working with me and keeping me strong and keep me focused and keep me my mind on what it needs to be on. So, I mean, I got a golden opportunity. I'm going to take uh, take totally uh, advantage of it now that I'm older, smarter, wiser. And uh, I'm just going to keep doing what I do and keep continue to be the best. I'm always going to be the best at whatever I choose to do. Whatever I choose to do, I'm going to be the best, brother. That's my mindset. Absolutely. Um, and, and don't let nothing detour me or stop me. And I want to show young people from different uh, ethnic groups that, you know, we all make mistakes in this thing called life because if I was perfect, I wouldn't be here. So, like I said, you got to go through life and grow through it. And I think I've done that. And I want to be a, a living example to the kids to show them because you go to prison, don't let the people behind those walls tell you what you can't do and what you can't be and all that. It's what you want to do with the decisions and the right choices you make. And that's what's important in being committed to what you want to do. No matter what it is, if you want to be good at it, you got to commit yourself. You got to make sacrifices. You got to understand to be the best, sacrifices got to be made. And, you know, when you want to be successful, you got to just bust your butt and just work harder than the next guy and stay focused on what you are doing and continue, and, and continue to believe in what you're doing and have good people with you. And I think that's the greatest joy right there is having good people with you. So when you go to the top, you take good people with you. So when you get to the top, good people will be there with you. They'll keep you on top. They won't be trying to pull you down because, you know, success changes a lot of things. And, you know, my thing in life is just be successful. And that sets all the critics up because I've been listening to critics all my life. Hey, man, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. All these people always told me what I what I can't do. No, tell me what I can do. Just take the T off can't and, and, and go with can because you can do whatever you're willing to work hard to do. I mean, it's in your heart and in your mind. You right. got to believe, brother, you know. And I'm a, I'm a true believer, man. You know, I don't let people deviate or get me off my path. Once, my, once I make my mind up to doing something, you know, my mind is made up and I'm one track when I make my mind up. And that's why I've always been successful with whatever I chose to do. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, I also wanted to ask you, too, uh, why do we never get a chance to see a James Tony rematch? Well, you know, James is a dear friend of mine. Me and James, matter of fact, that's crazy. Me and James just spoke last night. I mean, now that we mentioned his name, you know, I love James Tony. James Tony loves Michael Nunn, you know, and uh, me and James, we fought in the ring. And James told me, 
He said, man, I'll never fight you again. You got to be crazy. So, so we, we, we're we dear friends, man. I'm dear friends with him and his family and everybody. And every time I go to Los Angeles, we go to dinner, we hang out, and we do things. And, you know, James is super good. And we, we, we both use the same trainer, a guy by the name of Pops, Mr. John Arthur, which is a, a, a hell of a trainer and a, 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 a real ball breaker, man. I mean, he gets you in the greatest shape, and he's a hell of a man, and he works with me and James both. So, I mean, hey. Uh, James is my man, and that's crazy. Like I said, you just mentioned the name. We just—I was over at a good friend's of my house last night. We were just sitting around chit chatting, and uh, he knew I had a relationship with James Tony. He said, "Man, I want to talk to James." And I said, "Give me a couple minutes." Hey, hey champion. So when I called James, was evidently on the phone or taking care of business because you know maybe his wife had him cooking or cleaning yesterday because yesterday was Mother's Day. So he probably was you know cleaning the backyard up or something. And then he seen that I called, and he had the audacity to call right back. So. That was beautiful. And my friend, when he was so ecstatic by getting the opportunity to talk to James, he told James, hey, James, I love you, but hey, you beat my man, but I'm going to still love you, man. So right. you know, James started laughing. It was all good. No, James, um, James is a dear friend, man. And I wish me and James could have really fought again, you know, because he's the first guy to beat me in the great sport of uh, professional boxing. He beat me for my IBF middleweight championship back uh, May of uh, 1991 in my hometown in Davenport. I was undefeated. I was 35 and 0. Got a little careless, but we we don't make no excuses. He was just a better man that night, and we take nothing from him because you know he had uh, been losing most of all the rounds, and he came back and caught me with the left hook and won the fight. So at the end of the day, it was a great fight. It was a great middleweight fight, and you know James, good dude, and uh, I got a number of respect for him. James was a hell of a fighter, and he didn't just beat me. He went on and beat a, a whole lot of other good fighters and won multiple divisions and other uh, weight classes. So he was a great fighter, a good fighter. So yeah, uh, my man. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I want you to uh, tell the people uh, how you found Islam and how Islam has helped you. Uh, uh, well, you know, you um, right before I, I was incarcerated, I was a dear friend of mine, uh, Preston Muhammad, uh, a local guy here in the community. He's uh, one of the teachers and leaders and guides here in the Muslim community. Uh, he had been working with me, but I had already been involved in some other things and kind of got like sidetracked not to make no excuses because I'm held accountable for whatever I do or say. I was uh, getting involved in it back in early 2001. And then I ended up getting indicted in uh, 2002 and ended up going to the federal penitentiary for 16 years and six months. Uh, uh, and uh, while I was in there, you know, I met some, some decent brothers, some good brothers. And one thing about the guys in the nation, they're always going to be straightforward. The administration respects them, the inmates respect them. And, you know, the teachers just helped me elevate myself and get me focused on what my mind needs to be on because you got to remember the federal prison system is just it's another uh, cesspool in, 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 in uh, the wilderness of North America. You know, when you go in prison, man, if you don't have the right mindset and you're not doing things to educate yourself or to better yourself, to get you out of those situations, you go in there, you get involved in games, you go in there, you get involved with drugs, you go in there, you get involved with this and that. And, you know, you got to understand that when you're in there, the longer you mess up, the longer they keep you. So if you can't go inside the confines of the Federal uh, Bureau of Prisons and get your mind right, the federal government has no problem with keeping you there. They got hundreds of federal penitentiaries throughout the nation that they can ship you to, send you to, and as long as you want to act up and act a fool, they got you right where they want you. You got to elevate yourself. You got to change your mindset and better yourself to become a more civilized person. If you don't, these are the, uh, the, the problems you got to deal with because they'll put you in jail and leave you for the rest of your life because, hey, it's, it's job security for them people. So if we don't get ourselves right, shame on us. So when you go to prison, there's only two things you're going to do. Either you're going to get bitter or you're going to get better. And I chose to get better because, like I said, they got a place for you. And I don't care who you are. They got the ADX in Florence, Colorado. It's the Supermax. They got some of the most uh, dangerous criminals there. And they house there forever and a day. And when you get there, it's like a step-down program. You got to work your way out. And, you know, you don't wish nobody to have to endure that type of punishment. But when you do things to a certain degree here in America, the United States government, they'll throw you away. So I don't care who you think you are what you think think you can be when you get to mess with the government they will put your butt away and i just chose to get out there people's way hey you guys can win because i love my freedom out here and i'd rather be in society with my grandchildren my loved ones and you know i lost my mother while i was in uh incarcerated and um that was uh three years ago uh, uh she died uh uh let's see april 29th uh 2017 so you know i'm out here with my grandkids and i'm out here with my kids and my family and i want to be out and help support them man because Jail's no place to be, man. You know, I I, I choose my freedom, brother. You know, Absolutely. To get into trouble, get hooked up with these dudes, and they talk about these John Gotti's and 
they dissing, they debt, and you they, they everybody's this until they get caught. And now when they say 30 years of life, now these guys they start turn they become turncoats. They become Sammy the Bull Gravanos or whoever known rats as Joe, Joe Velachis or whatever. You know, these guys are informing the rats. So I mean, my thing is, brother, if you're doing it, you need to stop. You know, I don't tell nobody how to make money or get no money, but you know, hey, it's not just for me. I'm I'm out to people's lane, man. You know, I right. want to do things productive and positive and be able to do my thing and be able to live my life and have my freedom and not have to worry about that type of activity because you fight against a monster and it's a machine, they'll eat you up and they'll throw you away, man. And you keep messing with them, they'll give you what you're looking for, a whole lot of problems. I don't need them type of problems. I want to be able to enjoy life, eat good food, be able to travel around the world and be able to get recognized for the man that I am, you know, and uh, just keep it moving. You know, be able to, you know, do uh, talk shows with you and guys of that nature, you know, you right. know, ruin guys like that. I don't really have my freedom doing that. I don't want to be incarcerated in no uh, confined area where you can only move so many feet or go so many yards and people are always telling you what to do. And I right. mean, prison really taught me a whole lot. You know what I'm saying? I'm an Aries and I'm a type of guy that, you know, I like to do what I want to do when I want to do it. So, you know, I got to follow the rules and do the right things because when you do the right things, you deviate around the unnecessary things by having to be up under the rulership of another man telling you what to do and when to do it and how to do it and go over there, stand over there. And, you know, they disrespect you to the highest point because the thing is they want to break you down and a lot of weak guys go in there and get caught up in the circle and keep on letting them just misuse them and they keep going doing the same old super things. And when you keep doing the same thing, it's, it's called uh, redundancy when you can't think you wear a, a wet paper bag. When you keep doing dumb stuff and you keep, you know, uh, waiting on a different result, it's not going to happen. You got to change your ways, brother. Absolutely. When you can't change your ways, man, you in, you're in a hell of, you're in the hell and you're in that hellfire, brother. You got to be able to overcome the hellfire with the decisions and the choices we make in this thing called life, man, because it's so precious, so beautiful. And we got to be respected and love it and know to do the right thing because it's simple, man. It's nothing hard about life, man. People make it harder than what it really is, man. You know, it's going to be a struggle. You know, we're ordained a struggle, you know what I'm saying? And that's all part of life, man, because when we was in our mother's womb, uh, we, we struggled uh, fighting, you know, to be able to be in this thing called Earth and, to, you know, to go through the pregnancy. Your mother had to fight. We had to fight. So that that, great, that builds strength in our character and ourselves to make us men, to, to make us be able to make better decisions. Yes, indeed. Yes, life's indeed. a struggle, my man. And I tell anybody, man, whether you're boxing, playing basketball, whether you're being a CEO of a, a Fortune 500 company, whether you're running the hotel industry or the railroad industry, whether you're working at the gas station or mom and pop store, for it to be a success, you're going to have to work hard, man. You're going to be dedicated to your craft, to be the best you can be. And don't never let nobody tell you what you can't be, man, because, man, I used to have people say, hey, man, you can't do this, you can't do that, because you got to remember, I come from a small community in the Midwest called the, uh, Davenport, Iowa. It's known as the Quad Cities. You have five surrounding cities that surround me, uh, you got a uh, few cities in Illinois, you got a few cities in Iowa, you got Davenport and you got Bettendorf, which is in Iowa, and you got Moline, East Moline, Silvers, uh, uh, Milan, and uh, Rock Island. And it's, uh, it's five cities and it's, uh, it's a hell of a place to be raised. And like I said, I thank God, man, for, you know, uh, blessing me to be all the things that I do and never let nobody tell me because I came from a small community that you can't be successful because I heard it all. You know, I boxed all the way to the Olympic boxing finals coming off the streets, hanging out in the streets every day, doing things that I didn't have no business doing. But guess what? I fought all the way to the United States Olympic boxing finals trials to go to the United States Olympics. I was I was out to a guy by the name of Virgil Hill. And I mean, people used to tell me, hey, man, you can't do this. You can't do that. But when I climb from the bottom to the top, now everybody want to tell me how great I am. But see, that's why I just don't never let people tell me what I can't do because Allah gave me a talent and I'm maximizing it to the best of my ability, brother. I won't be stopped. I can't be stopped. And I'm going to keep it moving. So I just want everybody to always know, man, you can be what you want to be as long as you've got a belief system, as long as you wouldn't work hard and you got good people with you. There's nothing you can't do, man. And there's nothing greater than family, man. You know, uh, without it, I don't know where I would be, man, you know, because you know, I got grandkids and it trips me out every day. You know, I was in prison for 16 years. And hey, hey, months, champ, man, hey, champ. 24 Yes, sir. Hey, hey, champ, you can uh, you can pull the phone back some because you you on video, okay. so you ain't gotta be that close. Okay. But okay. well, that's cool. Yeah, like I say, my my greatest achievement is uh you know with my grandkids now that I'm home from prison because I had like maybe five to seven grandkids born while I was in prison incarcerated. I had two that was born before I left. They're like 19 years old, so they remember me because they was like two or three when I left. And these new these new kids, these brand I call them the new generation, right? Of the nun tradition. 
hey, these kids are so smart and so articulate. You would think these kids have been with me all the days of their lives, and I've only been home, uh, let me see here, about 14 months, right? And these right. kids, like, 8, 9, 10 years old, and they were born while I was incarcerated. But you see me around these kids, you think they've been in my life or I've been in their life all the years on, that they've been on Earth, but it's impossible. It, it's not true. I've only been in their uh, lives the past 16 months. And um, it's amazing, man, how them kids gravitate and, and really love you, man. Genuine love. They not love me because of what I can do for them or the money I can give them or the places I can take them. It's just genuine love. So, man, the lie is definitely the greatest for him to instill that type of love in a kid's heart. Because these kids, man, listen, man, I wouldn't go back to jail for all the money in China due to the fact of the love of them kids because my joy is being able to be with them, to lead, teach, and guide them, and to make sure that they don't make the mistakes that I made because I would never glorify to them or I went to federal prison for doing this or doing that to to oppose the government or to make it look like I'm somebody bigger than what I am. You know, I want them guys to go to school, get education, and I really want them to be a square to have their freedom to be uh, caught up in a federal uh, 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 penal system. Yeah, you know, so my thing is, hey, look, go to school, get education, man, and work hard and understand one thing. Your papa is going to support you and whatever you choose to do, as long as it's doing it correctly. And like I said, I'm going to lead, teach, and guide them only the right way, brother. Right. I don't want to be in hustles in the street, you know, not to knock no hustle in the street. Because like I say, I don't knock nobody. Whatever I've done, I've done my time, and I can come back, and I'm tree, I'm saying treetop tall, and I'm saying ten toes down, because that's my motto, ten toes down. Whatever I've done, I've done. And I'm not going to apologize to nobody. Hey, I've done my time. I don't owe nobody nothing. And I'm going to be who I am. And I'm going to just keep it moving. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. You know, and, um, right you know now, like you... I say, it's no pity party, baby. It's no pity party with Michael second to none. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. So you, you know, right, I'm, so in you... The, I'm in the paint 10 toes down every day from the prison yard to the real world. You know? For sure. For sure. Now, you were supposed to be fighting, um, or you, you looking into fighting the, um, a legendary MMA fighter. Uh, so oh my God, man! I mean, hey, man, with this, uh, with this coronavirus, it, it 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 sent us back a little bit. But you know, you gotta understand, man. When the time is right, it's gonna happen. It's still in play, and I'm looking forward to fighting the legendary uh, Pat Milicic. He's the MMA champion. He's a local legend. I'm a local legend. So we come together. We put a plan together, and we're gonna have two legends go at it. It's gonna be. It's gonna be not just great for the box community here in our our area. But it's going to be great worldwide because it's going to be a big thing because, you know, it's been a um, thing since the Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor, uh, 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 boxing extravaganza. So now it's a thing that me and uh, Pat, we come together with dear friends from 30 years ago. We've been knowing each other forever and a day. And he's a great wrestler, great football player, a great MMA fighter. And then I'm the boxing legend. And, you know, so we uh, we come together and we were able to, you know, come up with agreement. And once this uh coronavirus thing is settled. We're going to put on a great uh, performance here in the Quad City, our hometown, man, for all the boxing fans throughout the world and throughout the country. So we're looking forward to it, man. And I'm, I'm super excited, man. You know, I'm 57 years old, but I feel like I'm 27, you know what I'm saying? I went to the doctor about two months ago, and the doctor, he's a heart surgeon. He tells me, he said, no, what do you do? I said, man, I pray every day, man, and just live right and try to do the right things and make better decisions. He said, man, he said, look, we're the same age. He said, I'm a heart surgeon. He said, your heart is in better shape than mine's. I said, what? Man, did you, man, that made me feel like a 21-year-old kid. You know right. what I'm saying? For him to say something like that, this is a heart surgeon telling me that uh, my heart's in better shape than his. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But, you know, when you live right and you take care of yourself, you'll get your blessings, man. Absolutely, absolutely. So how how have you been, uh, you and your family been handling this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic? Have oh, you been, been uh, quarantined? Just like anybody else, man. We're not doing nothing. We're wearing our masks. We're just trying to be safe. Which we're, we're having uh, limit ourselves from being around a, around a lot of crowds and things of that nature, just, you know, loving one another, man, and just being close to one another because, you know, things happen for a reason in life. And this uh, thing is, uh, you know, it brings you even closer to your loved ones, your family, friends, peers, and things of that nature, man. And, uh, I mean, hey, man, this, this is tough, man. I mean, we this is, this is a real monster that we're dealing with, and we got to take it serious. And with all the people dying, man, it's sad. And... It's, it's super bad, man. I mean, just you know, I mean, all the people we losing with this, uh, this, uh, this monster that's going around. We gotta hurry and find a cure for it. You know what I'm saying? And I tell everybody around the world, man, just be safe and stay prayed up and uh, do the things you're supposed to do, man. And you know, try to avoid catching that disease because disease ain't nothing nice. You can be a world class athlete and catch this stuff and be dead in, by by morning. So 
don't think because you're in great shape you can't get it. You know what I'm saying? So just uh, take care of yourself, be safe, and stay prayed up. That's my advice to them. And, you know, follow the rules that people are telling us to follow, basically, because, you know, we don't want to do nothing that we ain't supposed to do because when you get it, man, it's, I mean, I've seen people go through some stuff with it. We've seen people die from it. We've seen people survive from it. But it just seemed like it takes life out of you, man. And my right. thing is hope and pray not to catch it. You know, all my friends and families and peers I talk to, I always just tell them stay safe and they give me the same word of advice, you know, so. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And um, what would you say your 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 most proud, your proudest accomplishment has been thus far, uh, both in boxing or outside of boxing or however you want to put it? Well, I would say uh, we'll start with boxing, I think. Uh, you know, I got a lot of great achievements by me, uh, you know, not just on, only winning the world championships, but defending my titles. But I would probably say winning my first world uh, middleweight championship, knocking out Frank Tate to become an IBF world uh, middleweight champion, uh, July 28th, 1988. That's probably my greatest accomplishment. Uh, then, you know, knocking out Sambu Kalambe because, you know, Sambu Kalambe was a, a real, real, real tough guy, man. And right. we went in the training camp to prepare for this guy, uh, Joe Goosen. Uh, he always trained me hard, man. I love Joe. And, you know, I don't take all the credit for the things I've done. You know, I think my team, you know, guys like uh, Dan Goosen, Joe Goosen, Bob Serkine, all my children, my, my my girlfriends, my mother, my brothers, my sister, and all my fans, that's got to be in there as well. But uh, I think uh, beating Frank Chase is probably my, one of my greatest achievements because a lot of people always told me, well, this guy's not going to become a world champion. He can't do this. He can't do that. So that's probably number one. But like I said, I got a lot of great achievements. And me being a father is probably my greatest uh I thought being a father was great, but now that I'm a grandfather, I think that's even better. You know what I'm saying? Because, yes, indeed. You know, having kids is, is man, is a blessing for anybody. And, you know, I, I bless for everybody to be able to have children. And unfortunately, everybody can't have them. But even if you got to adopt them to say that yours, it's just something about kids, man. The kids are the greatest thing in, in, in life. And then you, you got to always put your mother up there, too, because your mother endured so much uh, with you, being, especially being a single parent mother. And my mother gave me everything that she could give me and let her soul rest in peace for having a day, man. I love her. And I just went out Mother's Day and um, put uh, some flowers on her grave, uh, me and my nephew, Raymond Jones. So uh, that's probably my greatest achievement is my mother. And then you got to throw the kids and stuff in there. And, you know, like I say, the championships are great. But, you know, when you love a family, you got a loving family, a family do anything in the world for you. And they they, they prayed harder than I prayed, I think. You know, saying? You know like I say, don't nothing be the praying grandmother or praying mother, man. That's the greatest joy man or woman or child could ever have is having a praying mother or a praying anything, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I've had a lot of great mm -hmm. achievements. I can, I can name them, but I mean, my mother and, and my kids and my kids' mothers and things of that nature, they've got to be my, my, my top achievements, you know, because like I say, I endured a lot, went through a lot and overcame a lot. But, you know, I've done it with the help of uh, other people. You know, I never want people to just look at me and say, well, Michael Nunn, Michael Nunn. You know, it took a lot of people that, you know, rode with me, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that gave me the motivation and the desire to want to be successful because they look at just me, but it's bigger than me. It was a contingency of people that uh, motivated me to be the best. And uh, I got to give credit to everybody, man. And they'll be putting me in the Boxing Hall of Fame in California, October 4th of this year. And God willing, everything is back to normal by then. So I can go out there and be, in, be inducted to the Boxing Hall of Fame. I'm still waiting on the International Boxing Hall of Fame upstate New York, which should be getting with me because I think uh, I've already proven my worth in the boxing ring to be able to be uh, inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. But the people in California were so gracious to induct me into their Boxing Hall of Fame. And I'm looking forward to going out there and being inducted to uh, a couple guys that was on my team, the Ruelas brothers. And if I'm correct, I think Joe Goosen, my trainer, is going to be put in that night too. So that's going to be a real uh, uh, special night for all of us to have three world champions and the trainer going in on at the same time, uh, how big can that possibly be, man? It's a blessing, and I'm just thankful, man, that uh, I was able to do all the things I've done. But remember, I want to thank the team that rode with me, even the fans, not just throughout my local community, but throughout the whole wide world, because, you know, I got friends and fans all over the world. And I noticed when I was in prison, 7-8, uh, man, that, you know, people would send me letters from all over the world, and that made me feel good. I said, right. man, because being in prison is easy to be thought about or unthought about 
because you, you, you under the, the, the confinement of the United States government, and they in some prisons they treat you worse than others. And I mean, those guards they can be they can be uh, they can be rogue police, just like these rogue police in the street just shooting our black kids down at will. And right. what I don't understand is what they need to do is tear the system down and rebuild it and just put people in power is going to do what they're supposed to do because don't put them in power to do the wrong thing. Put them in power to do right. And it should never be about color because, hey, we all human beings at the end of the day, and it's not right for nobody, black, white, green, or purple, to go around and shoot a person because he's a certain color or he wears his hair a certain way. I think right. it's dead wrong. And I think the government needs to come down hard on all these rogue police and put them in position and start sending them to jail because that's where they belong, especially when they rogue police or a rogue anything with dealing with law enforcement or anything of power. You know, if you're doing wrong, you got to, you know, set these people down and you got to, you got to, you got to uh, dismiss these people just like you would discipline anybody else. And it's just sad, man. Super sad, man. And, you know, you no get up and I hate even watching the news because if it's not about the coronavirus, it's always somebody getting shot or somebody doing this or somebody doing that. And like, these, how the hell you get shot jogging around your neighborhood? Right. I, to this, I don't understand it, man. And I'm a real outspoken dude. And one thing about me, I speak nothing but the truth and I let truth be my weapon whoever I'm dealing with, you know what I'm saying? And that's the way that we're taught, you know, through our teachings. So we don't let nobody uh, tell us how to think. We think the way we're supposed to think, and that's correctly. And I don't like uh, when I see a lot of underlying things going on, you know, with, with certain people of color, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just not right at the end of the day. If you got a heart, man, you know, you respect the next man or woman like you want to be respected. I don't care what color you are. No doubt about it. Nobody gives nobody the right because at the end of the day, we're all human beings, man. And no matter who you are, no matter what the relationship is, don't nobody want to just be dogged out. Remember that. Yes, indeed. Yeah, you know, that's yes. the truth. Yes, indeed. So, uh, with your time uh, uh, in prison, um, did you, I'm sure you have witnessed. Uh, but can you can you tell the people about uh, for any brothers out there that's living a certain lifestyle that could lead to that to that place of prison? Um, my thing, you you my saw thing. a lot of injustice in prison. A lot of injustice, man. Oh, man, you think you see injustice in the world? Go to prison and, and you'll see. You know what I mean, you'll see how the people in power carry you, man. But like I said, you know, sometimes, you know, we become our worst enemies by the foolishness and the foolish decisions that we make. Why put yourself in a messed up predicament? It's already bad. And the people in power, they got you right where they want you when they got you behind the wall. And will they misuse you or mistreat you? Yes, sir. Why? Of course they will. But you got to understand, it's job security for these people, man. And understand one thing. I'm not saying all... Law enforcement people are bad. Yeah, you got you got a bunch of rogue guys that's in uh in in the system, and you just need to just tear them down because they get you in there and they'll they'll pull stunts, man. Uh, they think they're the toughest guys in the world when they got you where they want you at. Right. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, when you put your hands on them, you get more time. But they can beat you damn near to death, and don't nothing happen. But if you hit them, they'll give you another five or ten years. And you know, by me being a professional fighter. Uh, uh, train uh, guerrilla master uh, destroyer with my hands. You know I can't go around. You know uh, being volatile with my hands, and and if I do, they'll want to you know put me in prison for another thirty years or whatever. So you know when you go through prison, man, you got to be able to think, man, because when you can't think, when you just out there doing foolish things, man, they got you exactly where they want you, man, wrapped around their finger, man. When they got you doing foolishness, when you get to prison, man, you got to make your mind up to get out of there. When you get in there, you got to figure out the way to get out because if not, they got you as job security for them people and they don't care, man. And they're going to drag you and they're going to carry you any kind of way when you can't think. Believe that. Yes, indeed. You got to wise up when you get there, man. And you and when, you got to be even wiser when you get back out in this, this mass world because you got to understand I was gone for 198 months. That's 16 years and six months to the day that I left off the streets of Earth to go to federal prison. And when I got out of here, this mixed this mixed up world and change. These people ain't who they say they are. You got to watch them because you don't know what you're up against. You're dealing with monsters out here, man. My, right. my, the females is monsters. The men is monsters. And I mean, hey, man, you just got to be safe, sound, and, and cool because it's a different world now, man. I mean, you know, I mean, hey, with the new technology and all this stuff going on, it's a high tech world we're living in, man. And you're dealing with a lot of high tech BS. And you know, you gotta, you know, stay away from a lot of stuff that's out here, man. It's, 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 it's rough, man. It's bad. It's super bad. You know, I've been a, a great observer, but I like to thank my teachers for helping me be a great observer and let me know what's right and what's wrong and know who to be around and know not to be around because 
you get yourself in a world of trouble, man, not thinking thinking you was cool with a guy 20 years ago, but you don't know what that man been through and what he's doing and who he's doing it with, and they'll have you in jail doing 100 years, man. That's right, right. people, man. Absolutely, absolutely. The world really is unchanged, man. The world is just unchanged, man. I mean, it's, it's crazy out there, man. And you just got to govern yourself, man. You got to stay on top of yourself. And you got to discipline yourself. And I think them teachers, man, they really woke me up and they got me focused. And my mind is where it needs to be because you don't need, you know, I was like uh, Ice-T, moving 100 miles a minute, you know what I'm saying? Not thinking about nothing, just doing whatever I, I wanted to do. And that's the wrong attitude to have. And I tell my kids all the time, my grandkids, you know, think about it before you do it because it's like this here, man. I was reading something just uh, the other day where it says, if you're thinking about doing something stupid, that's all you got to do is go sit out in your bathroom and uh, turn your lights off or either leave the lights on and sit in there for about 24 hours. And then that stupid stuff you had on your mind, now you'll know if you want to do it or not because that's where your butt's going to be in a jail cell somewhere if you continue to go out there and do dumb stuff and keep making dumb moves. And then don't make no dumb move want to blame nobody. You got to understand, man, the people in power, going to do it. They're going to do their job. And when they do it, it's not always going to be right. They're going to punish you to the highest degree. So just think, of, like I said, you sit in that bathroom for about two or three hours. And remember, that's the jail cell you'll be sitting in for the next 30, 40 years of your life. If you go out there with this ignorance. So, you know, you got to get smart, man. Got to get smart. And those little small metaphors mean something to you when you can think. And I'm like, wow, that's wild, small. But it's really big because that's where you're going to be. Stuck in a jail cell. Looking crazy and stupid. <clears throat> And, you right. know, it's, it's a big old world out here. And, you know, life is so precious. You got to understand one thing, man. He bless you with life, man. You maximize and be the best you can be in this thing in life. You don't give it away. You give it away by you making foolish decisions and doing dumb shit. Excuse my French. Right, right. But that's what happens. When you do dumb stuff, you get stupid results. Like I said, we can't continuously do bad things. And then when something happens, hey, man, why they do this? Why they do that? They done it because you were stupid. You didn't change lanes, Joker. You know, we got to right. we must change lanes in this thing called life. 